なアルトマイクみたいになりたいでも電話してくれないオークランドとウクレンドから世界チャンピオンバーチャルプローズ始まるよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりバーチャルプローズよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよりよはい。AKA Henny Omega, AKA the Bandman, AKA Bougie Nagata, AKA Two Phone Scorpio, AKA Super Brazy, AKA Pete Gas Break Dip Dip, AKA No Speak Broke Boy, Kami Shinsuke Stack a Mill Up. And with me, one half of the Holy Scheming Army, one half of Lemolition, one half of the Bread Hunters, one half of the Heavenly Thotties, my main Oos, Mike. Hey, what's up, motherfuckers? It's Mike, a.k.a. Gooey Spicoli, a.k.a. Matt McGriddle, a.k.a. Steel Gold, Steam Odin, a.k.a. Dr. Swagner Jr. Dude, I thought about booting up Fire Pro the other day. I might have to do it now <laughs> after that inspo. Oh, I'll Today's get to that. Topic. Yeah, I'll get to that in the two-man scramble. Hell yeah. Today's topic, there is no topic. <laughs> With no audience, the virtual pros add some extra ingredients to make that two-man scramble an omelet. Hit us on Twitter and Instagram at VRTL Pros. Hit us on iTunes. Hit us on Spotify. Um, there's no SoundCloud anymore. That's weird. Um, <laughs> Discord always popping these days more so than usual. Um, and if you want to participate, email us at virtualpros64 at gmail.com. We got a medley of emails, Mike. Yes. You mind starting off with that first one? One just came in about two minutes ago, even. They asked, okay. they asked all the vert bags to email us because, um, we don't have any, we don't, <laughs> we don't have anything to talk about. And, uh, they, they came through. A lot of people came through. So we got a fucking bunch of them. So the first one's from Nate. It says, uh, book recommendations. Hey, boys. Just picked up the audiobook Eggshells Pro Wrestling in the Tokyo Dome on Audible this week to listen to while I work. Any other recommendations for Japanese pro wrestling books or audiobooks that are worthwhile? I've also already read Lion's Pride, which was a nice history lesson on New Japan. Thanks, y'all. Nate, a.k.a. Road Warrior Animal Style. Um, huh. I kind of stopped reading wrestling books after, like, the first wave. So, But I did I, I did pick up the, uh, the actual print. Well, not the print version, but the e-version of Eggshells and a Lion's Tale. Eggshells is pretty interesting. I didn't know there was an audio version. Um, it doesn't, it's more of like a reference book, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know if audio would be cool for me for that, but, uh, either way, I always suggest, I mean, it's not completely about Japan, but I always suggest, suggest pure dynamite. If you haven't read it, that's the, uh, dynamite kid autobiography, uh, high spots is doing sales all over the place and I know they have it. So I don't know how much it is right now, but you can probably get it for like 10 bucks. Um, Something that it has nothing to do with wrestling, but has something to do with Japan. And it's a book that I always mean to reread and I never get around to it. Is this book called Tokyo Vice that I'd also recommend? That is, uh, I forget the guy's name, but it's, uh, it's an American guy. Jake that, Adelstein, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and he, yeah, he's like the only, uh, kind of beat, like crime beat reporter in Japan. And, uh, he just tells like his most gruesome stories in the book. And it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty great read. They were supposed to make a TV series off of it, which yeah. seemed pretty natural given the stories in that book, but I don't think it ever happened. Yeah. Um, Japanese pro wrestling books. Uh, that Io Shirai um, first release, uh, Gravir, pretty good, that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Nate. It is good, though. Um, I guess if you want something informative, I mean, those Bahu FMW podcasts are super good, and I learned a lot from listening to yeah. those. That's like an audio book, basically, else. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Shout out to Bahu. Next email is from... Where the fuck are we? Abraham, titled Roster Cuts. Hey there. So when the rumors started about roster cuts, I immediately thought of Heath Slater and others, and unfortunately, he did, get up, he did end up getting fired. I find him to be entertaining, and maybe he will turn out to be a decent wrestler on the indies, or maybe even Japan. Who knows? Who else do you think will do okay for themselves and who will fade into obscurity? 
Also, if for whatever reason, New Japan also had to make crazy cuts on behalf of their trading card game overlords, who are five guys that are most likely to go besides Yoshihashi? Abe, a.k.a. Red equals green. I don't know. I, I just have this feeling that a good heel run Zack Ryder would be so <laughs> fucking good just based on his persona, his IRL persona uh, on the YouTube channel. I also think he'd be pretty decent in New Japan, but that's just me. I don't know. His offense is pretty modern. <laughs> um, Five guys from New Japan? If I had to cut him? Hmm. That's a tough one. Who am I cutting? I guess Juice can go. <laughs> Not people like Juice. Let me get let me get back to you on that, Abe. <laughs> I don't mean to pick on Juice Robinson, but I don't know. I feel like all their guys, even if they're like low card, have some sort of potential. I don't mean to be greedy or anything. Uh, yeah. Judging by the shirts, this these post WWE shirts, some of these guys are releasing. Um, it's I think it's gonna be it's gonna be hard out there for some some of these guys. I think uh, Mike Bennett and Noe Jose are two guys who might not have much of an <laughs> independent wrestling career. I know Mike Bennett was kind of like a guy before he went to WWE, but I don't know. He just released a shirt that says, Dilf, Dad, Dad, I'd like to fight on it. And that dude's been wanting to get out of WWE for like two years. And yeah. <laughs> so he's probably been thinking about shirt designs for two years. And uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's tough. Noe Jose, I just think... I think that dude has to go into hiding for like a year and change his whole look if he wants to be taken seriously anywhere. So hopefully he does that. I do think Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows are going to be fine. I think EC3 is probably going to be getting a lot of money. Obviously, Chris Harrow is going to be getting a lot of money. So uh, I think some people are going to be fine. But those dudes who are just like lifer WWE guys like Heath Slater and unfortunately Zack Ryder, who is the guy I was most worried about. Um, I don't I don't know. I don't even know if Zack Ryder's ever even worked an independent wrestling show so uh it might be tough for him um as far as new japan i imagine like a lot of white guys would get cut because they're uh like i don't know if dave finley lives in japan i mean he might but i think they might have to fly in a dave finley and uh i don't see <laughs> i don't see that cost uh you know amounting to much so i think a lot of non-japanese would be the first to get fired Who'd be the first Japanese guy, though, you think? Maybe I don't know. Bushi? It's, it's, Bushi sucks. It's always tough to, yeah, it's always tough to gauge because it's so different there. Like, Togi Makabe is like a famous person there, and so is uh, Toriyanu. I mean, I, th- you know, I think they they view the Tokyo pimp the same way we do, Yujiro, as kind of just a fucking bullshit guy. So I would think Yujiro, that other fucking guy from uh, Suzuki Gun that still wrestles, that I always forget his name because he's kind of just a guy. I could see him. Getting cut real quick. Uh, That's fair. Next email is from Scott. It is a uh, cred. Hi, Alan Mike. Hope you're well. On a recent episode, Mike joked that maybe people might feel compelled to say they, they like a certain album. Big Boy, I think. Yes, it was a Big Boy album. Uh, because they feel obligated to or weird or of street weird street cred or, cred or something like that. Do you guys think that some fans like certain wrestlers or shows because it's cool to do so rather than being a legitimate fan? Or on the other hand, hate a wrestler match because it's cool to do so. Context and timing is everything. Some matches are classics no matter what. Uh, but it's hard to expect someone who has recently become a fan to appreciate how great, say, Liger is. And uh, in rock metal punk, I'd say some people feel obligated to say they like Fugazi or Caius. I like these bands just fine, but some people fall all over themselves to say how good they are. Or am I a total poser? Probably. Chair, Scott B., Western Australia a.k.a. D. Beat Dudley, a.k.a. CZW Anderson, a.k.a. Dwayne Tarak Tara- Tara- Johnson. That's a good one. Um, first, I would just like to say maybe there's like different standards in Australia, but I don't think Caius, <laughs> Caius has held that in such high regards in America. Like, I like Caius, but I don't know. I, I, well, I don't think people are like fucking faking on Ca- Caius. It's a weird one. Um, as far as wrestling, I think it's kind of tough because... I think it goes in waves where like if a bunch of people are like hyping something or some wrestler, then like a bunch of other people will do the same if they've never seen them or stuff like that. Uh, At the same time, I think a lot of people just want to be different and they want to say the most contrary thing they could think of. Um, There is like a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff that I see like people saying about older wrestlers, like how good they are. And I'm just like, I can't believe it. Like, um, like uh, a great no, yeah, Lex Luger. That's that's one. I think stuff like that is just like kind of one of those. 
you know, it's kind of like people protesting that they want to go outside where um, it's it's probably <laughs> it's probably amplified more by the Internet than than it actually is in reality. It's one of those things like I think one of the things that I found weird and this is just coming from like a jaded old man's perspective is that they announced um, Great Muda for the uh, the spring break and people were hyped on that. And it's like, man, this dude has been like a broken man for 20 years. Like, I'm not really, I mean, it, it would be cool to, I guess, get his autograph or whatever, but I'm not in any rush to see Great Muda wrestle. And then, um, like, I remember, like, after he canceled and, like, people were trying to, like, stick up and, you know, I don't know, be positive about it. Like, I saw some comment where a guy was like, oh, he would have probably mailed it in anyways. And it's like, yeah, he doesn't have legs. He doesn't have knees. He has, like, robot <laughs> knees. He's going to mail anything in. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you were expecting, like, a five-star match out of the Great Muda coming to America. But, um, yeah, dude, that dude is, like, he's probably cool to shake his hand, but I don't want to see his wrestling matches. So, and it made me think, like, that dude has been, like, a crippled man for, it's like, since the early 2000s. So it's odd to me that any younger person is like all about it because like outside of outside, like once you get out, outside of the like iconography and stuff, like none of these people were even alive to see when he was good. So it's uh, it is kind of strange how shit like that, like maybe some people are pretending to like Great Muda and they've never really watched any of his good matches. I don't know. <laughs> Great Muda just got the fucking envelope full of Disney World passes and he's like. <laughs> Yo, I'm gonna fucking cut even deeper on that forehead uh, for spring break, no doubt about it. Fuck it, I'm excited for uh for Space Mountain now for sure. Um, modern shit, man. People are fucking falling over themselves for Jinder Mahal title run. Yeah, and that was one thing I never really understood. Like, who did he? Oh, he beat Orton, I guess. No, he beat. I don't I, know. I just so many posts, so many posts of the clip. He beat Daniel Bryan for the title, I believe. See, I don't even remember yeah. how how he won. So like. I mean, that's just me, but that was like a pretty weird one to me. Um, I know when Omega Okada got all the accolades for their first match, a lot of people are rushing to to speak on how bad that match is. And I don't know, dude, I don't know how you watch <laughs> wrestling. That's pretty weird. <laughs> um, but what's your stance on Luger, though? You like him? Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I've never really loved him. I thought he was just kind of a guy. I never really hated him or loved him. He was just always kind of a guy to me. Uh, I thought he was kind of corny when he went to WWF, but when he was in WCW, I liked him just fine. I think it's kind of weird that he's like a small, tiny man now. But uh, outside of that, yeah, I've never really had any strong opinions about him either way. Yeah, same thing. That uh, bionic elbow is good, but like everything else, I don't know. I just yeah. shrugged my shoulders at it. Uh, next email is from Emily, titled Question. Hi, Alan Mike. This is a request for Mike. Please give him an update on how the car food review people are doing during this time. Are they adapting at all? Or were car food reviews already socially distant enough? Same for whatever's going on with the Ryback. Sorry if you guys <laughs> already talked about this and I missed it. Emily. Oh, boy. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I do watch the food goblins closely, the fat guys in, in, in their cars that review review uh, fast food. And I was, yeah, I was pretty interested, curious, like, what are they going to do during these tough times? And a lot of them are struggling. They're, they're like, I can't not eat fast food in my car. And they're still doing it. Some of them are apologetic for it. I only watch like a couple on a regular basis now because it's just like they're so pathetic. But uh, one is named Big Daddy's World, and he's not even really famous. Like, I, he might top out at, like, a 1,000 views or something like that. So he has – there's other – you know, these other guys, this is, like, their income. So they have to do it. But Big Daddy's World does not have to do it. He This is not his income. And uh, he's been trying to stay in the house, but he's, like – he made, like, a video where he's, like, oh, I was I was, ur I was urged out of, outside of the house by Burger King. And, like, <laughs> just – I don't know. To me, that's just – that is – ridiculous to be like i can't i i can't live without trying the new burger king because uh i mean personally like we try me and my girlfriend try like you know on the weekend to to eat out like to get something delivered and be like this is our treat and uh not once has that ever been burger king or anything else that's fast food like it's <laughs> kind of like uh like i remember when this first started and uh you know we're starting to have to like lock down there's a video where he's like talking about it, like, you know, we're going to have to start staying at home. And he like he licked his fingers in the video. And I was like, oh, my God, dude, like I I don't know. I've probably talked about in the show, but I think licking your fingers is the most disgusting fucking habit a human being can have. But to do it on camera 
while there's like a, of this fucking crazy virus going around was just like too much so he's having trouble um there's other guys that do it like joey's world tour it's his income he still does it it doesn't seem as often the one guy i wanted to check for and uh it was dame drops and he's like the kind of the guy who like started all this a uh, little known fact dame drops uh, grew up the same place i grew up in we didn't go to the same high school he went to like a nicer high school but um so i have like a little hometown pride for dame drops we're the same age like all the same shit we just didn't go to the same high school but um there was like uh I was watching like music videos a couple weeks ago and there was like these fucking commercials that kept on popping up that were made by YouTube's quote unquote celebrities that are like hashtag stay home. And he's in one of them telling people to stay home. So yesterday I was like, I wonder if he heeded his own words and he's staying home. So I went to his channel and sure enough, the first like his newest video, he's going to five, five guys eating some bullshit hamburger with two other dudes in his car, like inches away from him. No protection at all. Just eating these fucking burgers and it's like, dude, you're such a piece of shit. Like, you're telling other people to stay home, and you're still fucking doing this horrible shit. So uh, overall, these these people, I mean, they're they're fat people that eat food in their car, uh, that don't eat vegetables, so they don't have you know they don't make the greatest choices in life. So <laughs> basically, nothing has changed. They're still doing it, and uh, you know they're probably gonna die soon. Dog. So uh, <laughs> my trip out yesterday was getting uh, some banh mi's uh, for mm-hmm. the week, I like having sandwiches for lunch. Um, and now their system is there's like a takeout window, essentially. So there's this lady in front of me. She has her friend drop off uh, the new boba ice cream bars. Have you seen these? No. OK, so essentially it's just like um, an ice cream bar with boba inside. Mm-hmm. It looks pretty good. I want one. But like they're like. <laughs> Really hard to get, like, Nikes these days. But anyway, (laughs) she's eating this bar, and she's in front of me, right? And for whatever reason, like, it gets towards the end of the the bar, and then she just starts licking her fingers because she's about to throw (laughs) it away. And, you know, in these dark times, the amount of, like, anger in my body was just (laughs) so much. Because, one, she's in front of me, so, of course, she has to pay with her money first. Yeah. And then she gets her order in front of me, and so... When I got my sandwiches, I like handled that shit like a fucking organ during like, a transplant or something, dude. It was fucked. I yeah, man. It. It's weird how bold people are eating food out in public and just like doing whatever. There's this other guy that um my girlfriend's more into YouTube. I can't remember what the fuck his his name is, but he's like a healthy guy. And he's kind of like high and mighty about it, so he's kind of a dick. But he lives in Chicago. He does a lot of like high and mighty healthy videos about places around Chicago where you can get like, you know, good food and blah blah blah. And uh, they did, like, a video where they're just out and about in to- town, like, no masks on. And, like, his wife is just eating, like, a bag of popcorn, like, while, like, rolling their baby stroller. And I'm just like, this is not safe, man. <laughs> like, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. Uh, the next email, you missed one. It's from the uncles. Uncle, uncle podcast. It's, uh, the subject is Cherry Reds. Okay. Oh, <laughs> cherry Reds. Hello, big man. What wrestler would each of you most like to receive a cherry red spanking on the bottom from? Your friends, the uncles. I think the obvious answer for me is uh, Taylor Hendricks. I think she would be pretty good at giving me a cherry red. But what what about you, Al? Who has the biggest hands, Braun? (laughs) Yeah, Braun, I guess. (laughs) Next email uh, from another band person. I might even say his name. (laughs) Titled, Help a Guy Out. Hey, pros, it's uh, redacted. It's been a while, and I know we both said some things, but I think what, with all this pandemic and all, we should all bury the hatchet. Love you guys. Okay, it's Wolf. Wolf is writing in. <laughs> anyway, since WWE laid off a bunch of superstars and producers, my questions to you rich guys is, which one of these laid off unemployed bums would you take out to an expensive virtual bros style dinner, and what would the dinner be? I'd take Carl Anderson to a sushi place, where you eat sushi off a naked broad. I bet that cheer him up. <laughs> I'd also take you guys to show my love. Also, shout out to Chris Hero. Love that dude. He can come with us. Same with Heath Slater and Rusev. Kurt Angle, too. Bet he's a poon hound. Good grief. Be safe. <laughs> love. J. Wealth. Um, for whatever reason, I, I think wrestlers might be picky eaters. And so I yeah. think... I just take everybody to go eat Korean barbecue. <laughs> um, I think everyone's satisfied with that pick. So, and plus, I have like a pretty big anxiety about picking restaurants and like people not liking them. So, that's always been like my go-to move is Korean barbecue. If I don't know you, 
Uh, for one, I just want to point out that I wonder if Wealth thinks any kind of like high end sushi restaurant is where you eat sushi off of naked women. Like if he thinks that's that's like what Morimoto's restaurant is, it's like you walk in and it's just naked women as tables. Uh, is not that I think that's kind of like for private parties, but I guess it's a good fantasy. Um, as I would probably, I I just mentioned it earlier. I think I was the most broken up about Zack Ryder getting fired just because. I think I said on this podcast, I just wanted that dude to live his dream forever of uh, traveling the world, buying dolls and uh, eating catering at WWE and uh, just being happy doing it. So, uh, you know, I'd like to hang out with him for dinner. I think steak is a good medium where um, even if the pickiest of eaters would want to eat steak and some mashed potatoes. So I would probably take him to like a nice steakhouse. Uh, uh, more on Welf's eating habits. I'm just curious <laughs> if he's ever had seafood before raw. Like uh, I've seen him eat fucking tomato mayo sandwiches, yeah. and so I don't know if that palate's uh, that evolved to have something like an uni, for example, or like a fatty tuna. So I know. Uh, I you mean, right in Welf, defend yourself. I know he's had uh, fish fries really big in upstate. So I know he's had he's had cooked fish, but you may mm-hmm. be right. He may have not have had uh, raw fish before. So. I just imagine him like that yodeling kid um, on Maddie Matheson's show where like he has to eat raw fish every time he misses like a, a shot in <laughs> basketball and he just dry heaves every time. Uh, next up is from Tim, wrestler on fan violence. Hey, Vert Bags, with the Dark Side of the Ring episode about Dave Schultz bitch slapping John Stossel being released next week, I was reminded of my own experience with a wrestler on fan violence. When I was a kid, my dad took me to see Star K-99. The card best known for Goldberg super kicking Bret Hart, in, Bret Hart into retirement. Uh, yeah. While walking around the arena before the show, I witnessed Hacksaw Jim Duggan punch out and chase a fan around MCI Center. Have you guys ever seen a wrestler beat up a civilian? What are your favorite stories of this happening? Sincerely, the Mushmaster, a.k.a. Takashi69, Segura, a.k.a. Carl Botch, a.k.a. Trill Osprey, a.k.a. Meth Rollins. Uh, I have unfortunately never seen this. I I look forward to it every single wrestling show I go to, and I hope it happens, and it never does. Uh, the closest I've ever been to that was um, when I was little, like, I don't know, you know, like nine or ten or something. It was when, fuck, it was when, I think it was when Sergeant Slaughter had the belt, and I think he wrestled Macho Man. Yeah, he wrestled like Macho Man or Ultimate Warrior in a cage or maybe both of them or something. Like, I don't know. I think it was one of them in a cage. Um, this is a house show that I went to and, um, some fan like fucking scaled the cage in like seconds, ruining my little kid illusion that it was hard to like climb a cage. Um, and he had like a poster tube in his hand and he started hitting like, uh, Sergeant Slaughter with it and like, Cops were in there in a minute, just beating the shit out of them, like in seconds, just fucking ruining this dude's <laughs> life. And, uh, but none of the, like, you know, you always hear stories about wrestlers, like throwing hands when that shit happens, but none of the wrestlers, like, threw them down or anything, but the fucking security sure did. But, uh, outside of that, I've never, like, I've seen Eddie Kingston come close a couple times, but, uh, I've never actually seen a wrestler put hands on a, a civilian. Um, I've also never seen a beat down personally. I guess my favorite ones on tape is uh, someone in New Japan, I think it was, or FMW. Um, they grab uh, they grab Sabu's head wrap off his head, and uh, he went in that, those stands and he beat the shit out of somebody. <laughs> that was really good. Yeah, I just, I I just saw that. Got- I, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I just saw a clip. I forgot who posted it. It was on Twitter, and I forget what it's from. It's from ROH, and Samoa Joe is like uh, giving a speech, and somebody throws a, a pile, like a roll of toilet paper at him. And Samoa uh-huh. Joe just like fucking goes in the crowd and grabs a dude, like yanks him by his collar and gives him security and security picks him up like a baby and just fucking, <laughs> and, you know, escorts him out like a baby. And like the dude is just still in his hands. This is like, in a you know, a regular adult sized person. And I don't know. It's <laughs> it's like I wish I could tell you what it was so you could like people at home could watch it. But just the visual of like a uh, fucking adult being cradled like a baby and too scared to do anything is uh is, is really something. I also think there was like one during the NWO heyday where Scott Hall legit just like stomps on this dude's head. And I'm like <laughs> shocked that he's not dead. Um, I got to find that one. It's pretty good. Uh, next email is from Eric titled The Babification of Pro Wrestling Part 24. Hello. I saw the safety police tweeting about Nia Jax's extremely tame buckle bomb on Kyrie Sane. And it made me wonder... Why do people freak out every time they see people fall down, even like pro wrestling? 
could you suggest some other forms of entertainment that they might want to gravitate towards? I suggest drag balls. And before anyone says anything, I'm not mocking drag balls. I think they're very cool, and I also watch them sometimes. But dancers fall down in those too, and I'd hate I'd hate it if a drag queen got canceled for being an unsafe worker because their death drop was too cool looking. Anyway, can we gently guide these people into some other pastime? Eric, aka presentable Adrian Adonis. Mike, what the fuck is drag balls? Like a like a drag show. Like oh, a, yeah. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I imagine something completely different. Yeah, okay, now it took more me context. a second now to realize put... it. Yeah, he means like a drag show. Thought it was like a weird like secondary sport like uh, cornhole <laughs> or something. Um, I don't know if this uh this move by Nia Jax was all that safe, Eric. I mean, yeah, if seriously. You watch the... <laughs> if you watch the clip again, you can hear Kyrie saying clearly say I'm not I'm not posted, and then uh, Nia Jax. Uh, throws her um, pretty far away from the turnbuckle, and Kyrie Sane hits her head on the bottom rope. I guess I'm a baby, man. I don't know. I <laughs> thought it was pretty, pretty fucking crazy. I mean, I don't think she got hurt, but still, I mean, there's a history there. Yeah, I think I think some of it's justified when people are like, oh, uh, uh, I mean, justified in the opposite way, where people are like, oh my god, I can't, like, they're so unsafe, and I'm just like, come on, fucking grow up. But uh, Nia Jax has kind of this history. And it's kind of like a unique situation because um, historically, up until like five years ago, all women wrestlers in WWE were bad <laughs> and like no one cared because they, they weren't there to be good. And now Nia Jax is bad in like a different way <laughs> way than uh, historically women wrestlers in WWE have, have been. And I don't know if they just they don't know what to do about it, I guess, <laughs> where they're just like, well, what are we going to do? She's a woman. We can't really punish her. So. I don't know. It's it's kind of a weird thing, but yeah, I do think that was a, a little da- dangerous. Um, at the same time, people do get a little like policey over it on the internet, and eh, you know, it's it's what are you gonna do? What are you, are you gonna fucking ban Nia Jax? What are you gonna do to, to do anything? It's wrestling, unfortunately, and this shit happens all the time. So it is something, and I do. I would suggest uh, drag shows too. It's kind of the same shit almost. RuPaul is on Friday every Friday. Uh, it's kind of the same deal. It's, it's, uh, uh, people doing like talent show type things and competitions. And it's a, that's a, it's a good substitute for wrestling. So yeah, just watch the RuPaul show. Um, Daniel. Yes. Another email. Hey guys. Great last episode. A couple things from our balcony in London. Uh, one, yeah. I was really shocked that neither of you vouched for a criterion of Gaia girls. Or for Guy Girls, is it the only art housey wrestling film ever? Two, very Virtual Bros question. How are you ranking Kanye albums from best to worst? Three, Galaxy Brain Quarantine thought. Does the career of Randy the Ram in, in The Wrestler make any sense to you? Why was he main eventing an ROH show in a ladder match in 2007, 2008? Please debate. Hope you guys are good. <laughs> Daniel. Uh, one, I, it might, it might honestly be the only kind of artsy, uh, showing in the normal kind of theater movie, like this guy girls is screened at uh, the spectacle, which is, this is the theater I used to show Kung Fu movies at. And that's a very artsy theater. Um, it's screened at Alamo, which uh, obviously people know that's kind of an artsy theater. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it might really be the only kind of like crossover artsy film. And, uh, like they probably could make a criterion of that, of it if they wanted to, or something similar. I don't know if it'll ever happen. I don't know who owns the rights to this. I think it's just some like fucking TV company that made this. So I don't know if we'll ever see it, but it would be pretty cool. Um, two, I don't think I can really rank the Kanye albums. I know the first few are <laughs> the only ones I really like. And uh, the rest of them could go fuck off as, as far as I, I, I care. So I think they progressively get worse, though. Every single one is worse than the last. So <laughs> so it's it's pretty easy to rank them. Whatever that gospel one is the worst. The one before that's the second worst. And so on and so forth. <laughs> um, I think the uh, the wrestler. I I always interpreted it as this was like. I mean, now it's pretty normal for wrestlers to come back and and have these matches and and uh, you know be booked on these indie shows against other indie guys. And it's like, oh, that's like a thing. And I think that wasn't a thing ten ten twelve years ago. So uh, I always interpreted it as like this was the last dance for these these old hounds to have this match. So. That's why it was a main event. I'm with that on the regarding the third one. Yeah. Um. 
You never watched the uh, the French documentary about AJ AJW, did you? Oh no, I did watch that. That one's good too. I don't think it's really. I don't think it really falls. It's not in. really a film, but I yeah. mean, like it's still pretty well done. Yeah. Um. Yeah, like Mike, all the the latter half Kanye is pretty shitty. Although Life of Pablo is good, I gotta give it that. Yeah, there's like, some good tracks on there. Yeah. I actually yeah, probably uh, like that one more. No, I was gonna say I like it more than uh, fuck, whatever the one that sounds like Marilyn Manson is, but I don't think I do. So I, I take it back. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. I I really hated that one when it when it came out, but I think it's kind of grown on me. So I don't I don't hate it as much as uh, Life of Pablo. I don't think. Yeah, the back half of the catalog, like Yay and the one with Kid Cudi or the the gospel album, I'm not a fan of. We've talked about this on our previous episode, though, but if I had to go top three, I would go Late Reg, College Dropout, and Graduation. Yep, same same for me. Um, Next email is from John, titled, Hey, fellas. No, wait. It's titled, Yo. (laughs) Hey, fellas. The other day in the Discord, we were talking about our own basketball skills, and it made me think of the question, what is your starting five from AEW and WWE, and who would win in a best of seven? That's easy, dude. WWE in a wash. Are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> for AEW, I would go with the Bucks at the guard spots because I remember seeing YouTube videos of them playing ball back in the day. I want Chucky e. T at the small forward. He went to Murray State, and he seems to be a big Sixers fan, so I assume he can play ball. For the rest of my front court, I'm going to go with guys who I'm not sure can play ball but would be beasts under the boards. Brody Lee at the power forward and Lance Archer at center. WWE backcourt, Bailey who was a good high school basketball player and the smaller dude from the Street Profits. Front court, give me Big Show, Kane, and the WWE secret weapon, Donovan uh, Dijakovic. All <laughs> actually played ball, and the WWE would need someone who isn't 50 in the front court. As for how this would all shake out, I am sure the WWE front court would crumble if the game was played full court, so I'm going to go with AEW in five. What say you guys? You're crazy, John. WWE has so much fucking talent on their roster. They would kill AEW five on five. Um, starting five for WWE, I gotta have Ricochet up there. Probably small forward. Mm. He's so athletic. Uh, Bronze too slow. Who's their tallest guy right now in the WWE? Maybe hey, Baba Tunde. Maybe <laughs> that guy. Point guard. I don't know. I think Kushida's like a he'd, he'd be he'd be a pretty good fucking floor captain, shooting guard. Roderick Strong looks like he can fucking shoot, <laughs> so I go with that guy. Power forward. I need an enforcer. I need a ghoul. Who's the ghouliest guy right now in the E right now? That's tough, dude. Yeah, Nia Jax. Fuck it, dude. Unsafe. <laughs> Give me those six fouls. Fucking earn them. <laughs> AEW, uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you, your picks are fine. Brody Lee probably can ball a little bit. How about you, Mike? I think WWE would win in a wash, though. They'd probably sweep that series. See, I was like you when, when I was just reading this. I was like, oh, easily WWE. But then when I put my teams together in my head, I was like, yeah, maybe AEW would win. Um, I, I went with only strictly people who are in WWE, so I didn't pick any NXT people. But... um. I went uh, point guard, Chad Gable. I know that's kind of a dark horse, but he's very That's athletic. a good pick, yeah. dude. That, he's the type of guy at a college pickup game that will like show up in New Balances and get you fucking hella boards. Yeah. Uh, shooting guard, I don't remember which one's which, but uh, the guy in Street Profits that could jump really high. I forget. Oh, uh, Montez, yeah. It's Montez. Okay, yeah, Montez Ford. Uh, that guy can jump 17,000 feet in the air. So, uh, small four was the one that I was having most trouble with. I, th- I think I would either go with Kofi or one of the Usos. I think, uh, they both can, you know, they both got some hops. Uh, power forward, I would go with Drew. I think Drew would be a good power forward. Fuck and I got, I got a fucking kind of wild card for center. And <laughs> so I don't know what pan out. And I know it wouldn't be a popular pick, but I'd probably go Baron Corbin for center. So. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's a that's the best pick for uh, for AEW. It's a tougher because they don't have the size, but um, center I think is besides me picking Baron Corbin. I think it's a very important position to me in in uh, basketball. So I'm gonna go for for Mr. Brody, of course, Brody Lee. Power forwards the wild card on the AEW. I'm gonna go Luciosaurus. I don't know if that guy's good or not. So 
Um, he's kind of clunky as a wrestler, so he might be even clunkier as a basketball player. Uh, small forward. Um, fuck, who did I who did I want to do? I was gonna say okay, I'll just go uh, point guard. I'm gonna go uh, Sammy Guevara. Uh, shooting guard, Darby Allen. Small forward. I mean, Ch- Chucky T is a good pick. Um, no, you know, I'm going to go, uh, fuck, uh, hangman for a uh, small forward. And I don't, yeah, I think it, I, I might give the edge to AEW because <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> I think, uh, I think they have the, the youth and they have the, uh, they have the, the talent, I think. If there's one guy I'd want though from AEW, it'd be Santana. I bet that guy can yeah. fucking light it up. No doubt about it. Um, I got the next my one. My turn, your turn. Your my turn. turn. Ed from uh, Pod Van Dam. People singing. Uh, hey, virtual pros, boys. I'm currently in a car with my friend who is very earnestly singing to this Bruno Mars song, fucking harmonizing to it. Is there anything more cringy than someone singing in a place that isn't a concert or a long to thrift store jobber's favorite tune, Judas? Real Zeta Zhang Instagram energy in this vehicle right now. Ed from Pod <laughs> Van Dam, <laughs> a.k.a. Cringe Foley. I think uh, Ed is known for his... uh. It's kind of hot takes, or I don't think he's I don't think he's in touch with the rest of society. So this is another hot take that I can't really back. <laughs> like uh, I don't have any problem. I think it's kind of weird if you're like coming home from a funeral or something, and somebody's fucking in the passenger's side, like singing some song on the radio. That's weird, but I mean, I think people singing the songs is kind of just like normal human nature, especially if you're like fucking drunk or something, and you're at like a bar, you're probably just singing to whatever's on the jukebox. So. Yeah, I can't. I can't really chast- chastise this at all. I don't have any problem with people singing along to stuff. Is that the guy? Is that the one from PVD that defended uh, Buster Rhymes' career trajectory? I no. I think that might have been Jonah. So I don't think that was Ed. Um, I guess the only thing I can add to this is like uh, being in the workplace. Man, what a time that was! There's always <laughs> one or two guys that love humming. <laughs> um, and they're not aware of how loud they're humming. That is the worst. If you do that at your workplace, just don't, don't do it. That's horrible. Um, but I'm okay with people singing. It's fine. I grew up with it. Um, second to last email from Nick titled hard man shit. Sup Alan Mike, the 30 for 30 Jordan documentary got me reminiscing on all the iconic stories of MJ shitting on people, friend and foe alike in pretty much every aspect of his life. In honor of the GOAT, what are some of your favorite all-time or recent disses, burials, or general cold-blooded hard man moments? Since wrestling is dead, feel free to expand this to other topics like music, sports, or gaming. It could be famous cases or smaller things you yourself have done or witnessed firsthand. Some examples for me would be Vince sending Stone Cold and Kurt Angle out like the Sandman at the Apollo to yank Buff Bagwell off the stage on live TV effectively ending his career in real time. Shabbat and no selling death to make sure he gets the rest of his spots in. Randy Moss putting his hand up at the line of scrimmage and cooking Darrell Rivas so bad that he faked a hamstring pull and gave him a (laughs) 40-yard touchdown. What comes to mind for you guys? Appreciate y'all. Stay safe. Nick D, a.k.a. Wealth, the punky homo sapien. (laughs) A.k.a. You said I'm whack. See me on the cart. A.k.a. Blame it on Baby Park. (laughs) Yeah, fuck Baby Park. Um... I guess the coldest, like, burial I've seen, I'm pretty sure you've seen this too, Mike, is uh, I think it was at uh, Emmett Smith's Roast, where uh, Jamie Foxx was the host. And they had this kind of no-name comedian named uh, Doug Williams, and he was just bombing. And then for whatever reason during his set, he gets at Jamie. And Jamie, for, like, five or six minutes, just, like, ethers this guy in real time. <laughs> And the camera work is so great because you watch Doug Williams just crumble and it is a horrific thing to watch. I think I read an article a couple <laughs> years later about how um, Doug Williams was still deny- denying this like burial, but <laughs> you know that ether like still burns slow in his heart. So if you have never seen this, uh, watch Jamie Foxx uh, roast <laughs> Doug Williams. I, I got to look this up because I, I do not remember this. Um I got a couple. They're both kind of unorthodox answers. One's from real life and one is from uh, not real life. Uh, the first one's from not real life. And this is, you know, I don't think 
either of these guys are known for being hard men, that's for sure. But it, I think it's still a hard man move. And this was, um, I don't know, like 15 years ago now. Um, there was <laughs> there's a rapper that no one remembers, a white rapper, kind of like a white hippie rapper named Soul, who uh, released a, an LP <laughs> diss track. And uh, it was pretty good. Like, he really got in LP's ass. And uh, to get him back, LP called this dude off and <laughs> made him sound like a bitch on the phone and then put that phone call into his track and then fucking just completely washed this dude in a track. And again, LP's not a guy you think like, oh, that guy could do like a good diss track. Uh, if you've never if you've never heard that beef, because I think it's kind of forgotten in modern times, but it's uh, a song called Linda Trip, and that is probably one of like the most like fucking lopsided diss tracks ever just because of how bad he washes this dude. But uh, so that's my hard man music moment. Um, as far as real life, uh, I used to work at old Navy when I was very like a lot younger. And uh, there was this girl that I worked with. I can't even remember her name. But I remember like we were cool and stuff. And, and uh, like for a few weeks, she'd just be like, man, Becky, the, my manager is named Becky. She's like, man, Becky cut my hours again. She's like getting more and more down about it. And then like one week she's like, man, she cut my hours again. She was like, if she does it again, I'm going to punch her in the fucking face. And I was just like, you're not going to do shit. <laughs> People say that shit all the time. They don't do shit. And then the next week her hours were cut down like four hours or something. She like opened the, you know, her schedule she looked at it and she just went right into the fucking back room and punched Becky in the face. And I was like, that's the fucking hardest shit I have ever seen. Like anybody who ever says shit like that never backs it up. So I was just like, man, that is fucking amazing. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the hardest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, aside, aside from uh, me hoping that you cut, um, they melts are saying makeup sex, makeup sex <laughs> as a clip on the soundboard. <laughs> I would love a. I love company flow. I love company well. flow. <laughs> I love company flow. That'd be so fucking good. Uh, so there's yeah, there's one email and then there's one Discord question. So I'll wrap them both up. Uh, this is from another Nick, not the same Nick. Uh, the last dance. What's up, virtual pros? Love the pod. It gets me through my long runs each week. Always excited to listen to new episodes. So last Sunday with a spiritual session for me. Uh, last Sunday was a spiritual session for me as I watched the first two episodes of the Chicago Bulls Last Dance documentary. As a longtime member of Team Jumpman, this hit so hard on so many levels. I'm just hoping that we get some rare footage in episode three of Rod the Bod, Dennis Rodman, bailing out on practice during the finals to show up on Nitro. Uh, the doc does an incredible job of re revisiting a time period and sharing new things on a topic by giving us the perspective of those who lived it. Uh, this is well done through the use of behind-the-scenes footage and interviews. My question for you all is, what wrestling event or moment in time would you like to see revisited in Doc style in 2020? And I'm not talking about Dark Side of Wrestling Doc. I'm talking an event in wrestling history that you could get former wrestlers to talk about combined with backstage footage. Uh, the first thing to come to mind would be the Montreal incident, but that was kind of been done already in the excellent Wrestling with Shadows Doc. Uh, maybe the backstory of the Dirty Dog Dennis Rodman is enough for me. What are your thoughts? Keep pushing. Best wrestling pod in the biz. Nick, a.k.a. Nike in the 90s, a.k.a. Dripple H. Uh, yeah, it's really tough to think about because, um, you know, the Montreal shit has been done to death. And it's like, it's always done so, so budget. Like Everything that's um, on it is like some budget shit. Even like no diss to them, but like High Spots put out that Brody, uh, Bruiser Brody documentary um, like a couple years back. And everybody's like, oh, you got to see it. And it's a good documentary, but it's still like a documentary produced by wrestling people. And it's just kind of like, eh, you know, um, so and they did that dark side of the ring about it. So it's hard to say something like Bruiser Brody. Um, I don't see I don't think I would even lean towards something that's so awful. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I think like I think WWE's been done to death. I think that rise and fall of ECW documentary is very well done and kind of enough for ECW. And that's, that, that would be like my go-to is like something ECW. Um, I mean, it sucks because like anything in wrestling that is like any kind of notable thing has been done to death by somebody. So it's kind of hard 
to think like I maybe I would just you know maybe I would do like the first year of, or maybe the last year of ECW like the last dance of ECW um it might not be the the best thing ever but it would probably be one of the things that I would be most interested in I think for me if I had to pick and like you had said I feel like everything's just been exhausted in terms of like what's been covered but I would love like a look at the last episode of Nitro mm. to when Vince actually buys WWE or WCW just because I'm just curious about, like, what went into that decision. I know it was dirt cheap at the time, but, like, I would love to hear, like, the backstories and the phone calls of, like, maybe Vince was just talking shit to Eric Bischoff or whoever was like, yo, <laughs> I, I for real won. And, like, that library's mine. And maybe there's, like, some interesting, interesting stuff in that, but uh, who knows? Uh, uh, the last... Discord? Yeah, the last... There's a Discord question from Steve. It says, bros... Well, I haven't been lucky to stay inside since I'm considered essential. I was inspired enough to cook something fun for once. I had a taste for jalapeno poppers and wanted to mimic the big popper sando from Milt. Milt is a uh, local Cleveland grilled cheese place, uh, but on a burger and obviously vegan. Somehow I nailed it for doing everything improv without feeling like a total ding dong from eating so much dairy. What's something from one of your favorite spots you've tried to make at home? Steve, a.k.a. the big border boss man. <laughs> uh I don't think I've, I mean, I've probably tried it and I just don't remember, but I'm not too big on eating something from like a restaurant I like and saying, oh, I'd, I'd like to make this at home because it's kind of just like, I, I just go to the restaurant and get it. Uh, I do, you know, I do re retro food ghoul and I've replicated things that I I can't physically have, um, such as the Taco Bell seafood salad, which was <laughs> out in like the mid eighties before I even knew what a Taco Bell was. And uh, that was gross. And I also tried the Taco Bell Bell Beefer, which is something I've always been interested in, which is basically Taco Bell's version of the Sloppy Joe. And that was fine. But, um, yeah, as far as things that I have and I'm like, oh, I want to make this at home, I'm I'm not really that type of dude, I don't think. Uh, it's not an actual place because I would never disrespect the Vietnamese culture by trying to cook pho <laughs> uh, on my own. I would never do that. And plus, pho is like so dirt cheap that I would just get it as well. Um, but for those that have seen Parasite, uh, they make this dish oh. called Ramdan, <laughs> which is uh, essentially they mix two sorts of uh, different ramen and then they add like premium steak. And uh, I did that one day mm. and uh, I added my own touches, uh, added a, a soft boiled egg, added some green onions, um, added a seaweed. And uh, that was big time chef's kiss on my end. I'm not a, I'm not a great cook at all, uh, but I, I've had many summer vacations and I feel like my ramen cooking prowess uh is pretty good and uh to add a nice steak to that all cut up on top of the ramen uh it's a good move it's pretty easy and i recommend everyone do it yeah i was uh when i first saw the movie i think we saw it around the same time it was before you know it was kind of before these these peons saw it and <laughs> and so like when it got to that part i was like i've never heard of this and i like googled it and the only thing that came up was the movie and i was like that's pretty fucking weird and so I didn't find out that it was like this, you know, it was just basically like, you know, kind of like a kid snack that just mixes two kinds of ramen until like way later. But I do want to do try that at some point. Yeah, I mean, like restaurants have kind of capitalized on this and they have their own like twenty seven dollar interpretation of it <laughs> where they use Wagyu. And I'm sure it's great, you know, but I mean, if you do have like um, any kind of meat, any kind of steak around, I'm, I'm sure it'll taste just fine. Yeah. Um, that was it for emails. Good looking out, guys. Yeah. If you want to participate, email us at virtualpro64 at gmail.com. Um, we've talked about it a ton, but Last Dance, um, was something that premiered on Sunday. And, uh, I'm lucky enough to have someone in the know hook me up with, um, some screeners for, uh, for episodes one through eight. Ooh. Um, I know, I know. I'm in the biz these days. <laughs> I didn't watch all late, but I'm up to, to four right now. And um, I was on another podcast called Ball vs. Life. Uh, shout out to them. And uh, we were talking about it. And uh, I made the mistake to say that LeBron was better than Jordan. And um, I'm going to formally apologize for saying <laughs> that. Because um, watching this documentary, you kind of just forget about how incredible Michael Jordan was during his heyday. Um, I, I, I guess I won't fully walk it back. Like if I had to start a starting five, I might go LeBron. If I had like a chance to like pick people at their peak, like Miami LeBron, 
it's probably some of the most impressive shit ever. But I mean, if you look at this dude's career, Michael Jordan, like he conquered everybody during his time. So like my whole argument for LeBron is he's playing against way tougher competition and that's not Jordan's fault, but it, it is a nice uh, documentary, I guess, when it comes to like reliving like all these moments that like I forgot about. And so if you haven't seen it, even if you have like the slightest interest uh, in basketball, um, I suggest you watch it. Uh, I'm assuming you've watched a couple episodes, Mike. Yeah, I've seen the first two. Um, I'm old, so I've obviously lived through Michael Jordan. That's um, yeah, kind of you know what basically got everybody on earth into basketball. That's uh, my age or younger. Like I remember before Michael, not before Michael Jordan, but I remember like the only basketball you would ever see on TV before then was Lakers versus Celtics. That was like all you would ever see. And then obviously Michael Jordan came out. So yeah, this is this kind of footage is near and dear to me. And I even remember, um, like it was probably like 1999, uh, just like after he retired, uh, like walking down the street with my friend and my friend just being like, you know, like we, we saw Michael Jordan, like we saw him like in real time and we're like there's never going to be anybody like that again and even at the time i was like whatever like <laughs> there's gonna be fucking plenty of people like michael jordan but i mean yeah i mean there's lebron but i think i don't, I don't want to say it's apples and oranges but it's kind of just like there are two different types of players i think like lebron's a lot more physical i think and uh michael jordan was basically like revolutionizing the game and playing against like all these old hounds that just like didn't know what to fucking do with them uh so it's it is kind of unfair to judge both of them i think i mean obviously i think i would always pick michael jordan over lebron just because it, he means a lot more to me um as far as the uh the uh the documentary i've only seen the first two episodes because i'm not as cool as al but um it's uh you know when i heard the premise where they were just like oh yeah he has like all this footage in the vault of like the, the final season and I was kind of like, we can really stretch this out into fucking 10 parts. And they totally can. Like <laughs> the, fr the first two episodes, I was like, I'm down for 20 more of these. Uh, it's so well <laughs> done. I'm glad they kind of released it early. I'm definitely looking forward to, to watching the rest. It's a uh, very compelling stuff. Um, they, they can cuss in it. It's not, it's, um, I think, you know, maybe Al has like an in inside track, but. I think me and a few other people are wondering if they're even going to talk about like his, his father dying and, you know, it was probably because of, of shit he did or if they're ever going to even get to get into that or glaze over it. My feeling is they're going to kind of glaze over that shit. And it's like after they get past like a certain point, after they get past like the first championship, they're just going to fast forward back to that last season or something because I don't know. I just don't see Michael Jordan comfortable talking about that shit, but I don't know. So uh, I don't know. You know, I'm kind of interested if they drop some bombshells in it, but I, I'm not really expecting them. Uh, episode three is dedicated to Rodman, and that episode is so fucking good. But apparently <laughs> episode six is focused on Michael Jordan's gambling habits. Okay. And uh, that's the one I'm looking forward to most. Yeah. Um, We've been playing a lot of video games too, Mike. Yep. And so I wanted to give a quick review on Final Fantasy VII Remake. Uh, pretty short. So I play like an RPG every like five or six years. It's not my favorite genre, but like once I saw like the trailer for this thing, I was like, I, I got to play it. I think the last Final Fantasy I played was 13. Uh, but in some, it took me about 45 hours. It's a lot of game. It's beautiful. Um, the battle system, if you are a newcomer to RPGs, uh, it's pretty easy to follow. And so if you're looking for some time to kill, um, I definitely recommend that you pick it up because it's just a, a lot of game for your money. Um I think you were contemplating about buying this thing, and I think you might be into it. It's quirky enough where, like, I know you like Yakuza, and so the quirkiness might uh, drag you in in this way. I don't know what your RPG uh, history is, but, I mean, have you kind of backed, uh, backed away from buying this, or are you in on buying this, or where are you yeah, at? Yeah, you're, you're thinking of somebody else. I am not contemplating buying this. That's, this is fucking, <laughs> no, so. you totally said I might, I might have to buy Final Fantasy for no, the first time. No, yeah, I mean, maybe, but I doubt it. Um, I remember when the first one came out, and a bunch of people were like, oh, this game is fucking crazy, and I just remember sitting down and playing it for like 10 minutes and being like, fuck this shit. Like, who? I, <laughs> when I was younger, so I got, I, I was a fucking dumbass that got Sega CD when I was a kid. And it fucking yeah. sucked. And the only thing that's good on Sega CD is JRPGs. They're the only good games that were ever released for Sega CD. 
And so yeah, I was, Sonic CD is good. Yeah. Sonic CD is good. I mean, there's that. a couple other things, but mostly like Shining, well, Shining Force. There was like a bunch of like yeah. fucking JRPGs that were amazing. And that was probably the height of my RPG playing because I was just like, these are the only good games. And then kind of after that, I'll still play like open world ones. Like I really love Fallout. I really love Yakuza. Um, but like shit, like Final Fantasy is just not for me. I think the last one I even touched was that one where you could play like a sports game in it. And I remember, like, my friend just let me play, like, the sports part. And I was just like, yeah, that's cool. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, I think, yeah, I tried to play, like, the first Kingdom Hearts when that came out, too. But I just, I, I guess I do. I mean, I do, like, quirky ones. I play fucking Pokemon, and I play uh, one of my favorite games ever is Capcom versus SNK Card Clash. And that's basically a role-playing game. But, um <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I if it ever like you know if it's something that's like twenty bucks, maybe I'll pick it up. But I don't see myself picking this up for full price. Um, my next topic it's also vital to our lives aside from video games, and that's <laughs> eating. Um, what's been your most shameful eating day? I'll go first. Today, I ate three crab croquettes. Those were good. I had five cookies. That was very shameful, and two slices of pizza. I, I gotta cut myself off, dude. This is not a good pace. <laughs> Have you had one of these days where you're like, man, the light outside is just getting dimmer and dimmer. We're getting closer and closer <laughs> uh, to our impending doom. Uh, have you had any of these days, Mike? Because today was one of those days for me. Yeah, it's just kind of getting like that worse and worse as the days go by, basically. Like when, when it first started, I was still like, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to have food. So I was like eating very little. <laughs> I was eating like two meals a day, very little, very small meals a day. Um, eating like all the leftovers, blah, blah, blah. But now I'm just, I'm now I'm just fucking snacking all day. Um, I don't, I, I mean, the, I, it's getting worse just in, I wouldn't say shameful, but like, like today I had a beef patty for breakfast at like 9 a.m. Cause I'm like, who fucking cares? Yesterday, I had, like, a beer. Like, I started drinking at, like, 2 o'clock in the afternoon because it's just like, you know, what's it fucking matter? So, it's getting bad like that. I wouldn't say quantity-wise it's not getting that bad because I'm still a little worried. Like, I'm just like, what if we can't get to the grocery store? So, or what if they stop delivering food? I mean, I don't, you know, deep down, I know it's probably not going to happen, but it's still just like, I, I don't want to chance it. So, I'm still not going completely wild as far as, as eating goes. But what I'm eating and when I'm eating it is definitely getting a little shameful. That's fucking funny, dude, because, like, the first, like, week of lockdown, I was like, it's just oatmeal from here on out, dude. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was like. And I was like, like, I'm just going to, it's potato dinners every day. Just fucking potatoes a different way every day. Like, let's get used to this fucking kind of, like, minimalist way of eating, dude, because <laughs> all the food's going to run out. And then week two happened. I was like, fuck it, dude. Let's make Ram Don. I saw it on Parasite one time, and it was fucking sick. Um... Weirdly enough, though, Mike, this is my last run. We're a wrestling podcast. Uh, that's what we're labeled as on the internet. Um, so I have like maybe one or two topics that we can talk about. So um, it was announced on the uh, the conference call today from WWE that uh, this year's uh, 2K game it's canceled. And I know this doesn't really affect us, but if you had to reboot one WWE game franchise uh, to take its place. What are you going with? WWE All-Stars. I don't even need to fucking think about it. Uh, the biggest mistake WWE has ever made is just not ever making another WWE All-Stars. I don't even fucking understand why. All-Stars was my pick, too. I remember <laughs> online being so fucking fun. And uh, I would like that, you know, remastered with a new roster. Um, I think I might have downloaded like a Bejeweled style of WWE oh, game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's like their main like RPG one. Elements. Yeah, that's their main one. They, they still do that. If it gets uh, on Switch, uh, watch <laughs> out because I'll buy it for sure. Yeah, WWE uh, All Stars. Top- WWE All Stars. I was like a little late to the game because I was like, I don't know if I want to play a WWE game. And man, I was like, as soon as I played, I was like, I can't wait for the next one. I'm going to get it the day it comes out. And uh, I'm still <laughs> waiting. Still, <laughs> still waiting for that day for that fucking the new one to come out. But uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. How they never followed it up. That game was so fucking good. It was really good, dude. I want a part two for sure. Uh, my last one. So apparently The Rock is producing an HBO series uh, based on backyard wrestling. Hmm. Are you hoping this is going to be like a comedy, like in the style of like a, a Eastbound and Down? Or are you hoping for like a more gritty documentary, like in the vein of uh, 
a bang it in Little Rock. Does it have they said if it's a documentary or like a dramatic show or what? They haven't said anything. Just that The Rock is producing, producing a project a fucking, about yeah. backyard wrestling, huh? Man, this is. I feel like this is one of those things that it says something on paper and it's going to be completely different because I think the time of backyard wrestling has passed. So yeah. I wouldn't doubt if like what this article or whatever you read by backyard wrestling probably means independent wrestling. And um, I don't know. I'm kind of down for like a dramatic, not Game of Thrones, but, you know, a dramatic HBO style show about wrestling. Norman Lear, the guy who made a lot of very famous shows like All in the Family Good time or not good times, uh, Jefferson's, uh, those types of shows. Um, he, uh, yeah, and yeah, good times. Uh, but, um, yeah, he was like years ago, like five, six years ago, was supposed to be doing like a dramatic type of HBO type of show about like old school 70s wrestling and, uh, just never like it never came, came to be. But that I remember when they're talking about that, I was just like, oh man, that's gonna like people are gonna fucking love wrestling after the show comes out, but. It never happened. So I do think if, you know, he does some kind of dramatic show about backyard wrestling is too fucking goofy. <laughs> so if it's really about backyard wrestling, I would definitely rather just see a documentary. But if it's just like a misinterpretation and they just mean independent wrestling, I would definitely rather see like some kind of dramatic HBO style show about it. I just want to follow up to the original, the backyard. Like, yeah. what's the lizard up to these days? You know, I would love that as well. Or the the Vince McMahon of backyard wrestling. Like, what's that guy doing? I'm fucking so curious. It would be good. Well, yeah, a good where are they now? Like, if they just, I mean, even if it wasn't even people from the backyard, if it was just, like, going through tapes of, like, these backyard people. And, uh, you know, obviously, yeah. like, M Dog would be in it and people like that. But Josh Prohibition. But, yeah, see what the, the other guys, what, like, the lizards are up to, seeing what they're doing. Like who's the guy? Like what's that guy up to that made the AIDS match? Like what's what's he up to these days? Like is he an important guy? I mean I doubt it, but I'm curious. That was my last one. Okay, uh, I got I got some. Mine are a little scattered. Uh, first one, as you guys probably know, since you're listening to a wrestling podcast, uh, the um, the WWE let go a lot of people. Uh. It's kind of strange in these days because, you know, back back like 10 years ago, this was normal. Like once a year, they would let go a lot of people and it was like a thing uh, ghouls looked forward to, I guess, <laughs> where they'd be like, oh, man, I can't wait to see what that list is. But, uh, you know, now it's under very shitty circumstances to fire people who obviously cannot really get another job during a pandemic. So it's pretty fucked up. I'm not going to get into that. Um but I just, you know, want to say uh, one of the Virtual Pro's longtime favorites got let go in uh, one Tino Sabatelli. So uh, in memoriam of that, I added um, a new clip to uh, the, sa- the soundboard. And of course, it's just. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> Fuck yes. This is just uh, in memoriam of one Tino Sabatelli that uh, got let go and. Um, you know, it makes sense. I guess you could say it makes sense that he got let go. He was kind of drifting. And was very uh, didn't know if he's gonna be a wrestler, a commentator, or whatever. So, kind of makes sense he got let go. But it is still kind of sad. Um, do you think Al? Do you think Tino Sabatelli is gonna pursue wrestling, or do you think he's just gonna go on <laughs> go on to some other part of life? Yeah, I know the one of the emails we got. It was like, who's just gonna drift into obscurity? And I don't think Tino Sabatelli is gonna make that independent run. Sadly, <laughs> I know, I know a lot of people were like, man, they're really missing the bag with Rusev. Yeah, Tino Sabatelli <laughs> not making it on the main roster before fucking Riddick Moss who <laughs> lost their van in the tag team match got to win a fucking strap for Sabby Piscatelli. It's it's fucking an injustice. I know you and I hate on when people are like, so and so deserves this look, yada yada yada. But Tino Sabatelli was such like a naturally good bad guy. He was such a G, as you would say, that. I just wonder what 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 could have happened if he actually got that call and that theme music, man. It's so good. It's real life good. We talked about real life hot wrestlers. That song is real life good. I agree. Sorry. It is it is a very good entrance theme as you are hearing right now. So uh, thank you. Yeah. So peace out, Tino. Maybe we'll see you. Uh, maybe AAW will pick you up. Doctor Keith, you hear me? 
Uh, get Tino Sabatelli on the horn right now. Let's give him a run. Uh, Tino Sabatelli, Nick Gage. I want to see it. <laughs> Fuck it. Uh, speaking of wrestling, uh, it was brought up earlier, Fire Pro. So, um, there, you, you guys know, you know, there's something going on outside. Uh, I don't know what state you guys live in. I don't fucking know what country you live in. Um, as far as Illinois, the, uh, the state I live in right now, they had, like most states, had a, uh, April 30th stay at home order. It just got extended today till, uh, May 30th. And I said on Twitter that if it gets extended, then I would look into doing another Fire Pro Twitch show because that seems like the hot shit right now where, actual um uh actual wrestling like promotions are doing it and let me tell you i don't want to shit on anybody doing this stuff but but it's fire pro let's let's throw borat into that card like there's no one doing like borat type shows they're not there's no one using uh draymond green and on their cards uh that's why you got to come to virtual pros you got to come to doggo mania whenever I don't, I don't know when I, I wanted to say next Sunday, but I, I think I might have to do some planning, but, uh, let it be known in the near future. There will be a virtual pros presents doggo mania, uh, type of virtual, uh, for fire pro Twitch show. I'm still working on the card, but I think I got to do a lot of work, but it'll probably be on a Sunday. Cause I, I always liked when, uh, pay-per-views were on like Sunday during the day. So look forward to a Twitch show, show Sunday during the day. Did you see fucking Draymond Green, dude? What the fuck? <laughs> I don't know. He's one of my guys. I have downloaded. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's What's just his finisher. I, like it has to be some sort of uh, ball kicking spot. Yeah, right? I don't even know. I don't. I don't. Never played with him. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of disappointing that all these people are like, we're gonna do a fire pro show, and it's like some wrestler guy against another wrestler guy. And it's like cool. Um, I could do that at my house. Like, <laughs> uh, I want to see weird shit when you're when you're booting up that fire pro and, and and broadcasting it. Show me weird shit. Don't show me fucking wrestling matches. Um, I want to see a two on one like fucking Draymond Green versus uh, Nakamura. Who's a <laughs> who else would I want to see? Hey, Boss Rutten, maybe. Yeah, I fucking hate the Warriors, man. I'm thinking it was discussed. Uh, listener, listener Harpo out there kind of brought it up. I think the main event there was a uh, the last Twitch show I did had uh, the virtual pros, me and Al versus uh, the horrible Uncle to Uncle podcast, and they got the upset. They got the upset win, and Harpo suggested we team up with uh, one Jay Wealth and go up against uh, Uncle to Uncle podcast and one Jumpin' Jim Grabowski. So I'm looking into that for the main event. You know. That's fine. I'm down. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll look into that as as one 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 show. Okay, moving on. Um, this is kind of wrestling related in in a way. Uh, the uh, I was watching old old commercials today from the '80s because I do that sometimes. So they're comforting to me. And uh, there was a commercial for an, a meat company called Holly Farms, which I don't know if, it, if that exists anymore. I don't. I don't remember buying any Holly Farms meat lately. But these motherfuckers in the eighties were selling na- like naked, not fried, not breaded chicken nuggets, um, just like totally <laughs> cut up pieces of chicken breast in that kind of meat pack you get, but like with their own little compartment. So every nugget of plain chicken breast was in its like own compartment. And I was like, man, this is a fucking scam and a half, man. Like <laughs> this is just a chicken breast. You would cut up a chicken breast at your house. You, <laughs> you don't need somebody else to do it for you. Uh, but I, I just want to know. I had a question. Uh, in, in the wrestling fan climate of, uh, chicky nuggies being, you know, the main food, the main diet of a wrestling fan, do you think this would trick them into eating something a little healthier if you just had like a chicken breast cut up, like pre cut up and sit and called it chicky nuggies? Do you think that would, that would, or do you think the wrestling fan would, uh, like they would despise this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, of course they would reject this. I'm like, are you kidding me, dude? I've seen these people's diets, man. Uh, I don't know, so man. Saying, I th- are they are- what? Good. No, I was gonna say I don't know. Like, I think it's just you know perception, man. You call something a chicken nugget, or call it even a naked chicken nugget. I think that you put that perception in somebody's head, and they're like, yeah, I, I like chicken nuggets. I'll try these weird flesh color chicken nuggets. I don't know. I don't know, dude. I think you're kind of underestimating the tastes of these people. I think <laughs> once they don't see any breading, they would immediately never buy it again and probably at Holly Farms and uh, <laughs> let them know that uh, whatever factory was making these treats uh, forgot to fucking deep fry these things ahead of time. <laughs> so I don't know, dude. You might be underestimating this crowd. Yeah. I mean, they probably only like I've never heard of this shit until I saw this commercial and there's only one commercial for them. So I feel like these things were like around for a couple months before people were like. 
hey man i could just buy a fucking chicken breast and do it this at home but i don't know i think it would trick some people into eating plain chicken or you know just chicken breast and call them chicken nuggies were they actually shaped like swimming pools and shit or just like no strips? it was like literally just like squares of chicken <laughs> uh, i, I rewound it it's way too neat yeah That's way too neat I rewound it because I was like, I, I don't believe what I'm seeing right now. And uh, sure enough, it was just like straight up cut chicken that they're calling chicken nuggets. Uh, my next one, a little, a little serious note. Um, yeah, is this how I want to do it? Yeah, yeah. We'll go into this for now. This might be the uh, this might be this segment for the, for the the show. Oh no, not that one. I'm sorry. I mean this one. There we go. I already know what's happening. Like, I don't. Look, I don't like it, dude. Oh no, like I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about what you probably think I'm going to talk about. But uh, no. Um, again, this whole pandemic thing. Uh, people wearing face masks. Again, I don't know where uh, you live. I don't know if they tell you you have to wear a face mask. Um, they're making. I think they're making it in Illinois mandatory after April 30th. Where if you go outside, you have to wear a face mask. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> I don't want to get sick. I'm cool with that. Uh, the one thing that I just want to tell everybody out there is can this please, please, please be the one thing that you don't need like internet justification for? Can you please stop taking selfies with your face mask on? I don't want to see this anymore. <laughs> like, can we just all be adults about this and just fucking wear them? Like, I don't want to scroll through Instagram and be like, this is me and my face mask. Like, I don't fucking care. Please don't do that. <laughs> like, this is a fucking serious thing. Can you just fucking wear it without any gratification from the internet? This is this one thing. You could still do the voting thing where you're like, look, look at my I voted sticker. Like, you can still do that. I'm fine with that. But just the face mask thing, please. <laughs> can we please just wear them and not talk about them? That'd be great. Uh, secondly, pivoting this into wrestling is uh, I've seen like a couple, pe- a couple two tree people making wrestling theme face masks and uh, selling them for 15 to 20 dollars which is a little steep i'm gonna tell you but um uh this is the most ghoulish thing i think anybody has ever done uh as far as wrestling merch goes because i i look i look at other people selling merch like outside of the wrestling bubble or selling face masks i mean and they're all giving to charity they're either giving the face mask to charity or they're giving the money they're making from the face mask to charity uh face masks aren't like fucking t-shirts man like not everybody has these not everybody has access to them you can't just sell them and make a profit and be a ghoul and keep it like fucking scrooge mcduck running through your money because you're fucking selling face masks to people who actually need them like i mean maybe you are and you're not just listing on your website but if you are legit selling face masks for 15 to 20 dollars and not giving any money to charity or not giving any face masks back to people who need them in your community you are an awful person this is like worse than making a chris benoit number one dad t-shirt this is worse than like any other thing you can do in wrestling um you are a horrible horrible person so anybody out there like thinking about doing this or anybody who listens to this that uh is is doing this right now if you are like i really truly think you're a horrible person and you need, you need to stop because uh just think about uh like have some compassion for once in your life <laughs> and like don't always think about money because it's it's horrible um okay I'm, I, I'm done with my my new jack natural born killer segment but yeah that just really bothered me like i saw a couple of people selling face masks and i'm just like this is this is not the time this is um it's it's pretty shitty uh make it a little lighter a little lifestyle um I know, I you know, I, I know Al. I know Al pretty well. I know he's a little concerned about his hair. Uh, today, I got some clippers in the mail that I bought because I was, uh, I thought I owned some clippers, and I don't know. I, I don't think they made the move with me, or they're still packed up. So I was like, "Fuck, I gotta, I gotta cut my hair." So, you know, I gave myself a haircut today. I've, I've given myself haircuts in the past, so it's not horrible. Like, you know, from afar, it looks like a normal haircut. You know, you get a little deeper in there. I probably fucked some shit up, but either way, it's fine. But I know, you know, I know Al's concerned about his hair, so I really and really interested. What have you been doing about your hair for the past month or so, Al? Not a fucking thing, <laughs> dude. I look like Mowgli from the Jungle Book right now, and it fucking sucks, dude. Um, I have touched up my sideburns because those get bushy first. And I <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It. And so that's been you know manageable. But uh, my brother, he he gave himself a little uh, two on the sides and it looks great. <laughs> but my brother's always he's always been a crafty person. But if I were to do that, I might as well just go fucking. I might as well just drop the top and shave it. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Bad are, thing I, is, though, is, are you going to get to a point like if we're we're locked down for another month, you're not going to just be like, I'm just going to fucking shave my head. 
It came close last week, bro. <laughs> it came real fucking close last week. But I, the thing is, I have a huge Bobby's World style head. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I wear glasses, and so I have shaved my head once. I, I, I try to rock with it. You know, I, I enjoyed um, the savings that I had in money uh, towards <laughs> shampoo because I have pretty long hair. Um, but in retrospect, like, all those photos look pretty bad, dude. I just look like fucking um, the Dalai Lama um, with my glasses on. It fucking sucks. Yeah, so, but, I mean, um, we're, not, we're, we're not really doing a lot right now, man. You, could, you shave it now. By the time we get out, it'll be like it never happened. There's that fucking period, though, where you fucking drop the top and then, like, it grows out and you just look yeah. like a glow mop, dude. And I, I don't know. I, I don't – I mean, I'm not going out and seeing anybody, you know, so – and I always wear hats anyway. Yeah. But I don't know, dude. I'm just, like – I'm just, I'm just too uh, vain to, <laughs> how, to drop the top uh, in this day of age. When we when we got locked down, how – how, how uh, like what what was your haircut level when when we got locked down or did you just get one or was it like were you still waiting the last time i got a nice like one on the sides fade was like late february and my hair goes <laughs> fucking fast dude yeah i lucked so out so if you seen like nakajima uh <laughs> in noah that's how my hair looks out the shower it's <laughs> fucking brazy dude and i don't know what to do about it like it's annoying because like anytime i get out of the shower and dry my hair like my bangs are all up in my face. So like, that's the time where I like contemplate, like <laughs> it's just time just to go fucking full bald, but yeah. I can't do it yet. Maybe in two months, if, if, if there's like no end in sight, <laughs> that'll be the time. But right now, like I haven't, I haven't reached the tipping point yet. Yeah. I was like, so full disclosure for people who don't know me out there. I am not really a facial hair guy. Um, it's, it just stops at a certain point and then it's just like, it's just annoying. Uh, I saw a fucking Welf sent me a picture of him. That man has like a fucking lumberjack beard. I don't even know. I think it's just in a month. He has like fucking six inches of facial hair on his face. Uh, yeah. that's, that's not me. My, mine just like grows very slowly. Uh, so I was like, fuck it. I'm going to grow a mustache. Cause when the fuck else am I going to ever do this in my life? So I have a mustache yeah. right now. And then I was like, fuck it. I already look like a fucking piece of shit. Cause I got a mustache. I'm just gonna let my hair grow. And, uh, yeah, that, that that wasn't happening because <laughs> like, my hair just it's thick and it just grows straight up so I, I was like i'm just gonna start to look like kramer and it started to happen and i was just like i gotta i gotta fucking <laughs> buzz this off so um i thought i could fucking hang tough through this whole thing but i i cannot so i didn't you know it's not completely like just one zip throughout like there's some layering to it so it's not too bad but i'm still just gonna wear a hat <laughs> to go outside again yeah, dude, I try to grow a mustache too, but I was reminded that I can't fucking connect it. So for like a week, I looked like a carp, and uh, that was not a good look, like fucking Confucius, and not even because like I had no tails, so it was just like a two inch gap on my lip, um, with two sides of hair. It wasn't a good look, so I just kept the goatee and let that cook. Uh, but I'm a mess right now, Mike. I don't know what to do. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tough. Why don't you fucking? Oh, do you not live near your brother? Can you just have him fucking do it for you? You know what? I thought about that too. I might as well just have him. Like <laughs> he did, he did a fine job on his own head. Yeah. You know, I would think he could do it for me, but <laughs> yeah, maybe. Huh? I, I'll have to holler at him about a fee. Uh, okay, a couple more things. Um, so I think last episode I was talking about how disappointed I was in the uh, the presentation for the NBA 2K tournament on ESPN. And I think shortly after that is when they started the horse tournament, which was even more disappointing because um, for whatever reason, they decided to include um, like vets, like legends and also WNBA players. And um, I don't even remember the woman's name, so I feel bad, but she was playing Mike Conley and Mike Conley's playing in like his nice fucking home gym. That's beautiful. <laughs> and she's just playing in like a backyard, like a normal, modest backyard. Uh, and it's just like, fuck, <laughs> this is fucked up. Uh, these WMV players don't get paid shit. And it was just like, for whatever reason, it looked like a webcam from the fucking early 2000s. And um, I don't like, I don't know what's going on where they can't broadcast this shit good. But any, anyways, it's pretty depressing. I was starting to get really down in the dumps that these, these they can't figure out how to make sports exciting with no crowd. And luckily, last Sunday, the MLS, the uh, soccer league, the American Soccer League, for, for those of you who don't know what the MLS is, uh, they started doing 
Um, they have like they already have their own esports team, so they started doing these things where they have like the their esports guy and um like a player from the actual soccer team playing together, and they've they've set up a tournament and they fucking these guys have got it right. They are uh doing it good. Like they have like real commentators that are like excited about it. They don't have fucking Ronnie Two K who sounds like he's gonna die at any second. Like it's just like people are really excited about it. Like they're fucking uh the play like. Obviously, I think FIFA dude or not FIFA dude, the MLS dudes probably um, not as famous as NBA guys. So I think they have a little more time to play video games. They're actually good at FIFA. Uh, so these are actually exciting. Like I judge things by if I could drink beer to them and I could totally drink beer to this and get drunk and watch it and like get into it. So if you guys are looking for a sports substitute and you don't completely hate soccer, this is coming on Sunday nights at FS1. It's uh, it's pretty well done. So check it out. Um I think I had, oh, really quickly, I don't think anybody plays this video game, but I bought Friday the 13th for Switch. I already have it for PS4, but I bought it because, like, people in Discord were talking about it, and it was on sale for Switch. Uh, this is a game that is a lot better if you play with friends, so if you <laughs> if you are somehow the handful of people out there that play Friday the 13th for Switch, and you listen to the show, which is quite a long shot, get in touch with me. I would like people to play with on Switch because... uh you know, you play Switch on the couch, you don't have to hook it up to the TV, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, I did want to finish this off with an actual video game topic, though, uh, directed towards Al. And that is, we've been playing, you know, we've been dabbling in Rocket League a little, but we've been mostly playing Mario Kart with, with listeners of the show and friends and stuff like that. And um, Al is very good at Mario Kart. I don't know if he wants to be humble about it, but he's he's very good. I'll, I'll give him that. He's uh, he's, He might be the best Mario Kart player I've ever seen. Uh, but one thing about Al is he hates the baby park. And, uh, Al, I just want to know, why do you hate baby park so much? For you guys who, out there who don't know, don't play Mario Kart. Baby park is like, it's a very small track where like, it's like a lot of laps and it's just very, very small and uh, it's confined and it's very chaotic. And that's why I personally like it because I like the chaos in it. But, uh, for whatever reason, Al hates it and I just need to hear him out right now. Hey, Mike, uh, can you do me a favor and hit that new jack button one time, please? <laughs> <laughs> if you pick Baby Park one more fucking time and you're listening and we play together, I'm going to kick you out of Discord. It's a fucking skillless level that requires no fucking tact. Uh, anyone can win at any time. It only matters until lap five. And if someone like lucks into like a red shell, then okay, maybe you might win. But any time other than that, it's fucking pointless. Like any other other track that you can play, like say uh, any of the Mario Circuit stuff. Perfect. Like That requires you to like be around first through third and then you're probably going to win baby park not so much so in sum if you like baby park you're a piece of trash <laughs> thank you uh but i mean i play with you and i notice you just p you pick the same dry ass courses over and over again so i kind of think you know you're only kind of good at some of mario kart and you're not an all-around great guy you just you just have your courses though and I think you need to prove yourself. Is that what you believe, Mike? Is that that's, <laughs> all right for charity? Pick whatever COVID charity you want. We'll go one through thirty-two, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. I promise you. I would have to get. I, I would have to get maybe a Maddie or maybe another Laotian kid to take my place because I'm not very good at Mario Kart. Um, Maddie, get Greg, Nick D. <laughs> you've been stepping your game up lately. Let's go one through thirty-two. Let's see how fucking one-dimensional I am at Mario Kart. <laughs> dare you? I also asked so um D and you really you really don't like the the small maps on Call of Duty either. I don't I just don't like chaos like that, dude. <laughs> I just feel like um there's a there's a map called I think it's called like shootout or fucking uh, <laughs> some stupid in the latest Call of Duty where like essentially you're just going to run into people. Um I pride myself to be a good hider. Um uh, I I crawl You don't play as a a, you don't play as a sniper, do you? No, no, I'm not a sniper. I wish I was that good to be a sniper, though. That's my dream, but like, I just feel like I'm too fidgety. Uh, but my game in Call of Duty is predicated on like sneaking up on people and uh, picking people off. I'm not a camper, I would say. I do run a lot. Um, but for like a shootout where you can't really hide, uh, I just don't thrive in those conditions. Baby Park, though, that's not your favorite track, is it? Uh, no, it is the, my, uh, cause that was for GameCube. I think it first came out for GameCube. That was like the only track I really love from Double Dash, I think. The rest of it I could just fucking go screw, but I really did love Baby Park and Double Dash. 
I don't know. It's just so skillless to me. Man. I don't know. It's just me. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think I always pick um, the map I always pick because, like, it's just a great opportunity to drift, and that's where I notice you and, like, other people don't take advantage of the yeah. the boosting in Mario Kart, and that's what you got to do to win in that track. Yeah, I sure do suck at it. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that that's all I got, so I guess we could take a little break and get into uh, our mixtape. Next up is the mixtape with Ayako Hamada, Shawn Michaels, RVD, and uh, a dude that I guess has a hot Asian wife, uh, (laughs) as I've read on the internet. Please stay tuned. Okay, we are back here on Virtual Pros episode 109. This is our mixtape segment. If you don't know how this works, each episode we both pick a couple matches or things, wrestling related things, put them on our YouTube playlist, which you can find at Virtual Pros Mixtape or by subscribing to us on YouTube, uh, Virtual Pros. And uh, then we, we talk about them, we uh, go over them. My, uh, my first match of the night is. Cornerstone Scott Carpenter versus Killshot. Uh, Cornerstone Scott Carpenter is better known as Kenny Omega in Killshot. Not the Killshot from Lush Underground. This is uh, Killshot, better known as Carl Anderson. This is from the Wrestling Retribution Project from 2011. So uh, the deal with this is if you are newer to wrestling or you just don't remember the Wrestling Rest- Retribution Project was some guy, I can't remember his name, was like, I'm putting together a wrestling project. Um, he put it on Kickstarter. It was like one of the first, you know, notable Kickstarters I remember because this was a while back. This was almost 10 years ago and Kickstarter wasn't really a thing yet. And he basically like, you know, got, he outsourced a bunch of people to put fund this, put money into it and promised them, you know, DVDs or blah, blah, blah. And yeah, like the whole thing with the, the wrestling retribution project is supposed to be like, you know, X amount of episodes. Like we're going to film 15 episodes and that's going to be a season. And, uh, you know, it's going to have a beginning and end and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, the perks were like, you know, get your fucking name in the credits or get the DVD set, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so they filmed all this with, you know, somewhat notable wrestlers like Colt Cabana was in it. Uh, Joey Ryan, obviously Kenny Omega and Carl Anderson. Um, I'm kind of blank. Uh, fucking Nigel McGuinness was on commentary. You know, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's known indie guys at the time. But the catch was is they all had different names. They all had different characters. They kind of played different characters for whatever reason. So, I guess, you know, it was kind of like its own little universe, kind of like Lucha Underground, a little predecessor to Lucha Underground. And uh, so, basically, they filmed it, and uh, the guy just, like, skipped town. And he, like, he never gave anybody any of the shit they paid for. Uh, the footage was just known to be lost up until uh, about a month ago where during this lockdown, this dude was like, I'm just going to put... I don't know if it's everything. I didn't really search it, but I'm going to put every, like the dude who I guess owns all the footage was like, I'm going to put it all on YouTube for free with no, no kind of celebration or pomp and circumstance. So it's all there. If you search WRP or wrestling retribution project, it is, uh, you know, there's now a lot of footage there. And one of, one of the pieces of footage, one of the matches is Kenny Omega versus Carl Anderson. This was, uh, Kenny Omega actually tweeted us saying this was the only time he ever wrestled Carl Anderson. Which is kind of odd, but, you know, I guess that's how it went. Um, And I never saw any of it. Like, I kind of forgot that uh, they even put it all on the internet. So I was kind of interested to finally see what this wrestling retribution project looked like. 
And it's uh, it's interesting. It's filmed in, I don't know, I guess it's probably like a hotel ballroom or something. There's like chandeliers. Um, and, you know, it kind of looks a little seedy. Um, I don't know. Like, I hear words like retribution and cornerstone. And I think this might have some Jesus shit going on in it. And I'm not sure. But it's, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the whole angle of this was. But I do know that Cornerstone Scott pa- Carpenter is, oh, Carpenter, that's another Jesus word. Like, they're all in there. So I don't know if this is some Jesus shit. But I hear Cornerstone Scott Carpenter, and that just sounds like a terrible wrestling name to me. Like, uh, I guess, you know, they couldn't use their real names. But I wish somebody was like, eh, maybe we could think of something better than Cornerstone Scott Carpenter. Because that's a mouthful, and it sounds like shit. Um and, uh, you know, kill shots fine. That sounds cool, I guess. Uh, but you know, you, then you notice things like their trunks, like, uh, Carl Anderson's still wearing a trunks that say machine gun on them. And Kenny Omega's wearing like this weird spider print, print trunk. And it's just like, you're going to change these guys' names and you can't give them fucking costumes to go along with them. Like, it's kind of budget. Uh, immediately it seems kind of budget. Um, <clears throat> it's also cool because if you look at this match, this match is basically a former G1 champion against a future G1 champion in Carl Anderson, because I'm predicting once the G1 comes back, Carl Anderson's going to be winning it. So it's just a little hot tip, a little hot take from me. <laughs> um, I think, you know, once uh, everything starts up and running again, obviously, I think Carl Anderson already said he's <laughs> going to New Japan, but uh, I think they're like, you know, this is our real top guy, Jin, right now. We have Carl back, so I think he's going to make a run. It's going to be like Switchblade Who, and it's going to be all about Carl Anderson. Mark my words, guys. It's happening. Um, so I th- read briefly on Wikipedia uh, about this wrestling retribution shit, just to like jog my memory, because the shit I said in the beginning, I just kind of was from memory. So I just want to make sure I got it right. And one of the things I did read was that during this match, and you see it sort of in this match, is... Um, Kenny Omega breaks a chandelier doing a springboard moonsault in this match. And um, in the Wikipedia, it says something like Kenny Omega was helping fund this. Like he put his own money in this. And then after he broke the chandelier, he was not allowed to take uh, payment for, for any, any more of uh, what was filmed. Like because he broke the chandelier and he had to pay for the chandelier, I guess. <laughs> Which I don't know how much he was getting paid, but that chandelier didn't look like that crazy to be like, oh, dude, you broke this. You owe us money. So uh that's how chintzy this is speaking of that though that's like one of the highlights of bad camera work they uh they they briefly cut away while he's breaking the chandelier not saying it's like an amazing visual but the the way they fucking talk about it after it happened um you would think that it was actually on film but it's it's kind of not like you kind of catch it a little but it's not like the whole thing you see it's not like they have replays or anything so uh, there's another part where I think like after like a power bomb or something and it looks like the person's going to get a pin and it's like a close near fall. The cameraman just kind of, I don't know, falls asleep or something and the camera just kind of falls to the canvas. And uh, so there's like shit like that in it, which again, this was, I don't think was ever supposed to actually be released. So I guess it's kind of excusable, but um, whatever. Uh, finally, the, uh, Kenny Omega is not doing the one winged angel here, but he's doing that kind of, um, put the guy on your shoulders and drop him down into a snap German, so- or, uh, through a release German soup. Ugh, sorry. I've been drinking guys. Uh, but no, uh, when he dr- drops him down in the release German suplex and that's what he's using as a finisher, which they call the corner stoner, which is maybe the all time worst name for a fucking finisher. Um, I don't know. I'm assuming it's the guy who was, t- was taking the money and directing all this. I think he was the guy who probably came up with all this shit, but he did not seem like the creative mind that, uh, maybe he thought he was. I know the only other thing I've ever heard about wrestling retribution is that Joey Ryan did this really progressive character as like a guy coming out as gay. And that was like this big thing. Cause I mean, 10 years ago, it probably was kind of a big thing, but, um, I don't know. I'm kind of interested in seeing more of this footage, but I don't expect much from it. I expect it all to be mediocre. As far as the match, it was decent. It wasn't anything I would like run out of my way to see, but it's a uh, young Kenny Omega still doing crazy shit. And Carl Anderson's always been decent. So it's a fine match. I can't like super recommend it, but if you've always been interested and curious into what WRP was, it's uh, it's finally there. So you can watch this or any other number of matches on there. But what did you think, Al? Yeah, just looking at this um, projected roster, like Finn Balor was supposed to be a part of this, Chris Hero. Um, but there was supposed to be a guy called Brick Shithouse. <laughs> and uh, 
I want to see this guy's work now, just on name <laughs> alone. So if you guys have any brick <laughs> shit house recommendations, you know what the email is. <laughs> um, but yeah, you talked about the camera work, and I also thought it was pretty peculiar. Like, am I supposed to be like watching this match from like the perspective of like a cat burglar or like a voyeur <laughs> or something? It kind of looks like I was peeking through blinds <laughs> because like the way this shit is shot, like. The ropes are in the foreground and the match is in the background. And it's just like, am I supposed to be watching this match? And on top of that, like, this camera, like, won't stop moving. And I don't know. I just thought it was terrible. To they watch. were just proto-cinematic, um, man. This is the shit that WWE is doing now. It was just 10 years ago. That was awful. <laughs> what I am into, however, is the idea of watching wrestling with my friends um, at a circular dining table. Um <laughs> It was like a bunch of people. Uh, it looked like a dim sum setup. <laughs> um, I thought that was cool, like because I hate personally putting like my food and my drinks on the floor if there's no cup holders. So this is like an ideal setup. Um, I actually heard about the chandelier incident um, on a talk is Jericho, and uh, when this happens, this actually might be five times more uh, than BJW uh, because <laughs> they actually get cut up, and it's pretty fucking crazy. Um. But what I am, like, really curious about, though, um, speaking about Talk is Jericho, is I guess Kenny Omega's name was uh, Scott Carpenter. And that's because he was supposed to be some sort of craftsman. That was his gimmick. <laughs> and uh, I would really love to know, like, the character arc for Kenny Omega um, as, as a carpenter. I mean, maybe you're onto something because Jesus was a carpenter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was a time in Kenny Omega's career where he would rev up his arm. To get those uh, arm hairs up to chop somebody down, you know, <laughs> fucking time is a flat circle, man. Truly, yeah. um, but this match was fun. Uh, my first match of the night was Rob Van Dam versus Shawn Michaels, WWE Raw eleven twenty five two thousand two, and so uh, I picked an RVD match because America, uh, we recently celebrated a national holiday, so I was wondering how your Monday was, Mike. Was it good? Yeah, I'm too old for that shit, man. I just I fucking smoke weed every day. It's not it's no different to me. There was quite a line out, quite of self uh social distancing line outside of the weed store across the street from my house though. So uh I all those dudes, they always front like, "Oh, I need my medicine." Like this is like I really have a, a fucking handicap and it's like, "No, you don't, dude. You just have a medical card." And uh <laughs> you know, if you really had a handicap, you would have got weed before 4:20, but uh but no, you know, it was a, it was a normal Weed smoking day for me. Nothing nothing crazy. So this match on Rise for the world title, which reminds me uh, of one of the biggest fuck finishes of all time. <laughs> where at ECW one night stand, Paul Heyman all of a sudden was a referee and uh, counted the three count on John Cena. And when that happened, I was like, not upset, but like I've never seen like the promoter just declare themselves as a referee. Like has this finish ever been familiar to you mike like i feel like this is the first time that ever happened it's ecw rules man you never know what's gonna happen yeah that's true um i made the joke on twitter but fucking hbk has a full isabel <laughs> from animal crossing haircut in this match he has a ponytail and just like two long sides uh much like me right now um, so i guess i can't fucking diss him that hard um and although like the second half of hbk's like in ring career was like a lot better to me I think other people would agree with that segment as well. Uh, Presentation-wise, like, this is not a good look at all. <laughs> um, in the middle of the match, uh, HBK, he throws one of the rudest uh, dragon screw leg whips in this match, and uh, it got me a little nervous. Uh, Mike has a hang-up about uh, <laughs> stomping. I don't know, dude. That, that dragon screw really fucking gets me going. Um, but I thought this was, like, a pretty decent TV match. Um, I don't know if the chemistry was there between these two. Uh, because personally for me, like the best HBK is when like he's getting his ass beat and then he makes a comeback and uh, RVD had no chairs at it as it is <laughs> at his disposal. Um, but I guess like matchup wise, like it's a pretty decent curiosity watch. What'd you think? Uh, yeah, the first thing I wrote down is maybe Shawn Michaels is too old for this haircut, but I think he just <laughs> like, I don't, I don't think there's any age that was okay for this haircut. It's just a, a bad one. It's a bad haircut. I think think i want to say because this time's foggy for me but i think this is uh you know a little after he lost a hair match to uh triple h so i think that's why he has the bad haircut i'm not really sure but that's what i'm that's what i'm thinking um 
So this was still 2002. It's starting to get into the dark days of wrestling, but it's still fairly popular. Uh, popular enough for people bring signs. And uh, there's several instances of people walking by when they know the hard camera's on. Uh, walking by, holding their signs, like walking by the rows from you know left to right. And uh, while holding their signs, so, you know, blocking several people's views instead of just uh, one person in front of them. And I just want to say, I hope nothing but horrible things have happened to all these people that did that uh, <laughs> since this was filmed. Like, I just hope their life has just been all bad luck ever since that, because that is a fucking very selfish and very shitty thing to do. Um, I I actually hope that the This Is Work Rate guy from Canadian Stampede is doing well, because that made me laugh. <laughs> uh, that guy's cool. <laughs> Um, I, I, maybe somebody, I could probably maybe Google it and I didn't, but I would like somebody, a historian out there to tell me what the fuck is going on with Shawn Michaels tights during this. I thought he he had like some weird money print on it or something, but it's not a money print. It's just like some weird money esque design on his trunks. I don't know if it's some Jesus shit or what the fuck it is, but it's a real weird design that I don't remember. And, uh, yeah, I would just like some kind of backstory on this because, uh, wasn't really a good look. So, so uh, yeah, if anybody knows, like, has some insight into what was going on and why he wore this weird design on his on his trunks, let me know. Um, finally, as Al kind of alluded to, uh, the best Shawn Michaels when he's getting the shit beat out of him. And this is kind of like the opposite, where Shawn Michaels is dominating RVD, and RVD's not really working his type of match, and Shawn Michaels isn't really working his type of match. And it's still pretty good for what it is, but... Um, it's on Raw, so you kind of know there's probably going to be a, a fucking bu- bullshit finish, and there sure is a bullshit finish, so any kind of momentum this match builds is kind of ruined by the bullshit finish, and it's fine for what it is, but it is kind of like, oh, this is, I don't want to see ass beater Shawn Michaels, and I don't want to see Art Rob Van Dam selling for 10 minutes, so I don't know. It's a cool curiosity thing, but it wasn't my favorite match ever. Um, <clears throat> My next match is from War... The uh, Wrestle and Romance promotion from 1995, their third anniversary show. This is a six-man match featuring uh, Mil Mascaris, Mascara, Mascaras, Jimmy Snuka, and Bob Backlund versus The Eliminators and Hector Garza. Um, there's also, I picked the 12-minute version or 13-minute version on the mixtape. There's three separate versions of this match on the internet. One is eight minutes long, and it's the the best, highest quality, um, and it includes intros. Uh, then there's this version, which is kind of a shit quality and is uh, has a commentary and no intros. And there's a 20-minute version, which is the full match, which, again, has no intros, uh, shitty quality, and no commentary. And uh, I think I chose the best, probably. This is probably the best happy medium, but uh, if you see this match and you just want more of it i'll just tell you right now there is more of it out there so (laughs) i don't know why you would want more of it but it is out there um i do i picked i chose this match because i do kind of miss stuff like this i don't think this type of shit exists anymore because now anytime there's like a weird matchup people kind of make a big deal out of it and like that is like their main promoting point is like oh there's this weird match you gotta go see it and uh, this shit just kind of happened back in the 90s where you would have these weird matches, matchups of mismatched people wrestling each other. And uh, I kind of miss shit like that. So that's why I picked this. I don't think we could ever get back to an era like that with the internet. So it's always fun to stumble on these matches. Um, I also don't remember the trajectory of the Eliminators. Like, obviously, I know when they got like popular in ECW, but... I don't know what happened to the costume and face paint eliminators. I can't really remember if they even existed ever in ECW. I'm sure they did, and I just don't remember it. But my my brain is pretty foggy from celebrating too many 420s, I guess. But um, <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of shitty, it's kind of disappointing that they started off sort of, uh, you know, they're mostly begun as uh, this very, you know, cosmetic team that has like this costume that's cool and they have face paint and all this shit, and then uh, you know. <laughs> the end of the ecw they're fat or one of them's fat and uh there's there's no face paint and they're just wearing trunks and it's like man what the fuck happened you guys just run out of money for the face paint you run out of money for the costumes what happened why you guys just get fat and just wear regular fucking wrestling trunks it's weird uh so yeah it's cool to see the eliminators in this uh this stage of actually giving a shit about their appearance um one thing you could take away from this match is that bob Backlund, 90s bob Backlund, so good i don't 
I I mean, this is not like an opinion I need to put on Twitter and wait for people to reply to me and be contrary. Like, I just think 90s Bob Backlund was such a good character. And it's good to see that translate into Japan where he's, he's you know, he's fucking arm dragging people and doing his weird dance afterwards because he's so happy. Uh, he's such a great character. He's uh, one, of, one of my favorite kind of wrestlers from the 90s. Just uh, I love Bob Backlund. I remember when they tried to bring him back with Darren Young in WWE, and I was pumped, and it just kind of fizzled out immediately. But uh, I love seeing that guy, so it was cool seeing him in this. Um, also, famed murderer Jimmy Snuka is in this match, and he uh, he was also on Dark Side of the Ring last week, so this is also a little topical. He gets to the match, and he does those fucking like grade school karate chops or like kung fu moves. Where he's like, you know, yeah. doing the shit with his hands, and the the fucking Eliminators and Garza are selling for the <laughs> these fucking bullshit karate chops as if they are like the most painful things on earth. And God bless them for going through this. I don't know how the inner workings of wrestling work. I don't know if you have to discuss this with Jimmy Snuka, and Jimmy's like, "Listen, brother, you know, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do these bullshit chops, and you're gonna act like you're fucking super hurt." Or if these guys are just so respectful of Jimmy Snuka. Because they didn't want to be murdered, so they were just like, "We're gonna act like these these fucking really hurt." Um, outside of that, you know, this is a fun match. It's nothing. If you have no, you know, no kind of attachment to any of these wrestlers, I wouldn't recommend it. But it is kind of like a, you know, it's a fun spectacle. It's a fun little '90s mismatch type of match. Uh, there's there's silly stuff in it. I don't need to ever see the 20 minute part, but it, you know, it was decent overall. Uh, not much else to add, but like, I gotta assume Tenru or whoever booked this shit was like heavy into like fire pro simming because there's <laughs> no reason why these six people should be facing off, but they did. And it's good. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, ECW historians like refresh my memory, but was like the Eliminators gimmick, like specifically, like they were outer space enthusiasts. <laughs> Like Perry Saturn's like a weird name. Oh, I, mean, Cronus, I know yeah. Cronus. Yeah. Cronos is like some Greek mythology shit. But like when you look at this version of the Eliminators and you compare it to like whatever showed up uh, at Barely Legal, for example, like there's really no connect anymore. And yeah. so like maybe that's my 30 for 30. Like why did the Eliminators <laughs> uh, go from like using like sleeping stones to just being like guys with like space <laughs> names? I'm curious. Who knows? <laughs> But yeah, this was short. I mean, the version Mike picked, uh, but it was satisfying. Like, everyone does, like, their greatest hits, and you get, like, really bizarre face-offs like Jimmy Snuka versus John Cronus, and so uh, I appreciated it a lot. The last match of the night is Ayako Hamada and Akino versus Etsuko Mida and Mima Shimoda Arjun, 12-11-1999. So Akino, she was out here with my uh, February haircut, <laughs> um and given the circumstances right now if i can give myself a step haircut uh, like akino i would for sure rock with this shit uh mima shimoda by the way in 2020 mike she is a hyper visual fighting still out to this day <laughs> so uh konbanwa and he does um so this is a pretty serious question to the joshi diehards i know you guys listen um but if ayako and her dad uh gran they had a beat off of sorts with their top five <laughs> matches. Uh, who wins on that one? Because like, I feel like everything I see, like when they're involved, like has always been like really good. So I'm curious as to who had like the better discography. Let me know. Um, like any other good Joshi match, uh, this match starts off pretty hot. Uh, there's some pretty uh, convincing eye torture uh, from Queen Mima here, and uh, Ayako hits this wild top rope Asai moonsault. I kind of think she might be like Io Shirai before Io was, dude. She might be even better. If, it, if like I do like a time machine challenge, <laughs> I'll let those two go at it, dude. That'd be a super good match. But anyway, they do like this pretty slick editing trick um, in post, I guess you would say, uh, where the team split apart during like the brawling um, portion of this match, and they uh, fire off a, scre- a split screen view uh, on each brawl. And I think that should be like stolen. <laughs> I think that's a good idea, dude. Like sometimes brawls get a little too like uh, chaotic, and for me to get like a split screen on the action uh, would make it easier to follow. Um, so the reason why this was uh, suggested in the Discord, I assume, um, and I know I kind of spelled it for myself because a couple weeks ago, um, the clip version of this match appeared. 
but Ayako Hamada and Akino, uh, they're coming in this match wearing the home white uniforms uh, <laughs> for a reason. And uh, that's because uh, during that brawl, um, they come out fucking leaking. Like Ayako <laughs> Hamada looks like she got mushed in the face with a cherry pie. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's like thick. And this might be one of the craziest uh, mood to scale matches I've ever seen personally. Uh, it went 22 minutes. It went, it went 22 minutes. <laughs> um, I thought it was worth uh, everyone's time. We've been talking for way too long, dude. Uh, but this was really good. I liked it a lot. What do you think? Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of things about this match. First off, maybe I'm not hearing it correctly, but I'm pretty sure the, uh, the announcer in the ring is saying their license number they're saying he's saying like license number 24 and then he <laughs> you know he says ayako humada humada ayako um somebody who knows in the know why is he reading their license numbers and what the fuck does that mean uh maybe it's some other number but he's definitely saying something number and then saying a number so uh clue me in what the fuck does that mean because it's it's weird um mita etsuko was in ne- very neon yellow she also has a neon yellow chair to match her look, and I think that's pretty sweet. Speaking of things that are pretty sweet with this team, uh, her and her um, her ugh, her and her partner Mima Shimoda have uh, these really huge, uh, reflective, like almost tinfoil type of robes, and they are super fucking cool. And uh, some somebody somebody in wrestling needs to rip this shit off because these are like the coolest robes I've ever seen. Just rip it off; no one's gonna know. Um, as, uh, as Al said, the, uh, the split screen action is definitely something that needs to be ripped off. I don't know why no one else has done this. This is, I guess, I guess there's no use for it for mainstream wrestling, but you know, there's, when is there a fucking brawl in WWE with a tag team where they go in two different places? But if you have the means to do the split screen shit for your promotion, you got to do it because it's fucking great. Uh, another thing that. I don't know the actual answer to this, so maybe there's a reason for it, but I really like the look of the smooth ring more than the uh, the canvas ring, and I'm sure there's a reason why people don't use the smooth rings. I'm sure it's because it fucking burns your, your skin, stuff like that, like sliding on it, but <laughs> it definitely looks cooler. It looks, like, looks cleaner. It looks more painful, so if you're a promotion out there and you have access to using the smooth ring, then uh, use that instead because it looks way cooler. Um as uh as Al said, uh this match goes from zero blood to thirty blood in like seconds where you're just watching and they're brawling outside. And I mean you see you see when when the blood's gonna happen and it happens and it's a lot of blood. This is I, I mean, I don't want anybody to fucking prove me wrong, but I think this is the most bloodiest woman's match I've ever seen. I don't think I've ever seen a woman bleed as badly as uh they are bleeding here. And saying that, you know, I don't know these guys, these girls, uh, you know, I don't know their fucking backgrounds going to this match. Like, I know, I know some of them, but um, I don't know their alignments. And I would have never guessed that the team in white was the, uh, or no, I'm sorry. I, I would have guessed beforehand that the team in white was the mean team because I thought they looked meaner. And it turns out they're <laughs> not. It's the neon yellow girl and her friend and their silver robes and silver and gold robes. They're the mean team, and they're the mean guys who are fucking doing all this damage, and it's uh, kind of jarring. You wouldn't expect that from somebody wearing neon, but they are sure the meanies. Um, but yeah, outside of that, this match is six stars all around. This is a fucking great match. This is an amazing brawl. Um, I don't really watch, like when I watch Japanese women's wrestling, I'm never like, oh, I'm going to see a brawl. Because you expect more like pageantry and crazy uh acrobatic moves and shit like this but no this is like a serious fucking bloody brawl uh the, even the near fall sequence which those usually don't age that well but even that's fucking great like i don't know what the fuck this match was for <laughs> i don't know if it's for like your careers or something but this was super dramatic and you would think like their lives were on the line as as uh as far as how, how hard they wrestled this is a serious recommendation uh this is something i think is absolutely must see I think it's going to take a lot to knock this out of my favorite uh, mixtape match of the year. Uh, two things. Um, one, from ProRestBlog.blogspot.com, um, they introduced all the girls by their license number. And if you didn't know, Arjun gave all the wrestlers numbers, which is pretty sweet. I mean, fucking NBA players have numbers. Well, give Becky Lynch 22. Who cares? I guess, yeah, I you know, know, it is a way, like, if you are back then before the internet... 
if you are uh english speaking watching this you can be like oh that's 24 even if you don't understand her name so yeah i guess that's that's a cool way of doing it I forgot my second point. Oh, well. <laughs> it's fine. We have been talking for... I thought this was going to be a 58-minute episode, and it's an hour and 58-minute episode, so... It's fucking all the last dance questions, dude. We yeah. should start that fucking Patreon and do some watch-alongs <laughs> or something. We'll see. That was episode 109 of a Jumbo Virtual Pros podcast. Hit us on Twitter and Instagram at VRTLPros, iTunes, uh, Spotify... Hit us at the Discord. We're always talking shit. <laughs> um, if you want to participate, email us at virtualpros64 at gmail.com. Mike, any last words? Hey, stay home if you can and wear a fucking mask. Don't lick your fingers either. Don't man. lick your what fingers. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>